Tech is a bi-weekly podcast exploring the intersections of technology and ministry. It is part of the podcast network sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Our show today is hosted by Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Welcome back to Wells Tech, everybody. This is episode 734, and we're recording on September 26th. That's a Thursday in the year 2024. Welcome, everybody. My name is Martin Spriggs, a show about technology and ministry. And joining me on that show about technology and ministry, as usual, Sally Draper. Hello, Sally. Hi, Martin. Happy to be joining you today, but happy that I'm not the only one joining you today because we have some special guests with us. Um, I will keep going. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Go ahead and introduce them. <laughs> sure. <laughs> As if they need any introduction. <laughs> they, it's back to school time, and we are back to having our uh, semi-regular education correspondents, gurus, join us on Wells Tech, and uh, that would be Rachel Feld and Jason Schmidt. Uh, happy to have, welcome you guys to the podcast today. Hey guys. Hi, Rachel. Hey, I am very happy to be here and I'm extra happy for Jason because this is the third time he's gotten to see me this week. So he is just having a great <laughs> week. I, you know what? It is like seriously one of the best weeks. Like it's anytime, moon, anytime yes. I can communicate and collaborate <laughs> with you guys, like it just, it just puts a, a big smile on my face. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be back. You guys keep inviting me back, which, you know, I don't always completely understand, but uh, mm -hmm. it's wonderful to be here and I'm, I'm glad to, glad to participate. Really happy to have you guys again. Yeah, we take a break over the summer, and as school kind of gets ratcheted back up, we try and have a show focused on technology and education and, and all things like that. So this show is is no different. So Rachel and Jason, thanks for joining us. Um, as we were kind of figuring out what to talk about. We try and theme the year and try and focus on something that we carry throughout our conversations with, uh, with Rachel and Jason. And um, one thing that I think comes up in almost every year we talk about this is how to integrate technology into the classroom, because it seems like there's a lot of ways to do that. And all of them have acronyms. <laughs> uh, so, so we picked another one, uh, and this one we've talked about in the past, but we felt that, and, you know, I don't sit in the classroom every day. So this is actually very helpful for me to kind of think through this as I and try and put this in, in the times that I do teach. Um, and so a framework is, is super helpful to me, but maybe our, other listeners, maybe even teachers, but I would think our pastors and others think, well, why is a framework, an integration framework even necessary? So maybe we can start with that kind of open-ended question and then jump into some things that are a little bit more specific. So why why do we spend time putting acronyms on these things and talking about, hey, you really need to think strategically or systematically about how you implement technology in your in your education best practices. Rachel, Jason, you want to take a take a stab at that that big old question? Sure. Uh well, I think acronyms make everything better. Oh well, yeah, for sure. Because they're acronyms. <laughs> um so <laughs> But, you know, the world of ed tech is so huge um, that it really to just dive in, you go, where where in the world do I start? There are so many choices, um, you know, I, I so many directions you could take that without a framework of integration, you're probably going to be floundering for a while um, and just not really knowing which way to turn or or which cool tool to to dive into. So those frameworks can um, make help make those decisions a little easier for you and uh, make the decisions uh, a little more systematic as far as 
making choices that will really impact your classroom versus choices based on whatever, uh, you know, the email that comes to your inbox looks the cutest or, mm-hmm. or they have the best TikTok videos saying how cool their tool is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jason. And I would, I, w- no, I would add to that too, Rachel, that like, <clears throat> Um, when we when we adopt a framework, um, what like the biggest advantage that I see too, besides the decision making piece, is that it um, it helps us to have more of a common language around how we're using these different tools. So like you know, if I'm if I'm looking at a technology tool, I can look at it and talk about this with my colleague. Like I'm using this in a substitution manner because X Y Z, or it looks like you're using this as a way um, to to, um, to augment the work that you're doing. Right. So, um, so really having that, that common language around how we're utilizing these different tools really becomes an important piece when it comes to things like professional development or networking or, um, any of those kinds of things. It really helps people to think about not so much what they're using, but how they're using it. And that's really, you know, cause if you go back, I'm sure, I'm sure I probably said this on the show in the past. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not about the tools. It's about the learning and, you know, the things that we're doing with them. I don't care if you're, you know, using whatever tool, but what are kids getting out of it? And that really needs to be the focus of these conversations. And these frameworks help to help to drive that discussion. So um, we've alluded to acronyms and I know that there are several, I think on the show, we actually focused on pick rat in the past. I really, that stuck with me, that rat part mm-hmm. for some reason, but um, there's something called triple E, but the one that we're adopting, the the framework du jour for Wells Tech this season is SAMR, S-A-M-R. And so maybe one of you can walk through those um, different steps that are part of that framework. Rachel, I'll defer to you to get things started. Okay. As the um, doctor of education. But not quite yet. <laughs> Closer, but not quite yet. Right. Um, so this was actually the very first tech integration model I was ever introduced to. And I still remember um, seeing the, the Play-Doh video, um, which maybe we can link in the show notes if I find it for Sally. Um, and that was... That was kind of a long time ago now that I think of it. Um, but the the SAMR model looks at um, how the teacher is using the uh, technology in the classroom. So we've got the, the substitution level where basically you're just using technology instead of what you would do be doing in the classroom anyways. Um, then you have the augmentation or uh, level and that's where you're still using technology for something that's kind of a substitute uh, but there it makes it a little bit better Uh, then you have 4m modification and that's where it's still kind of a substitute but it is a much better substitute Um, and you can do things that really improve uh, the task or, or the the final product, and then the last uh, level of the SAMR model is redefinition, and that's the one where uh, you're using technology, and if you didn't use the technology, you couldn't do the thing. Uh, so things like uh, making videos in the classroom without the technology of a video camera, um, I don't, you can't make a video. So mm-hmm. that would be that would be a redefinition. Yeah. So like, I always like to talk about these in, in terms of examples. So like my, my go-to example for SAMR is when we're talking about like a Google doc. So, you know, a substitution use for a Google doc would be, um, this is like, instead of giving kids a paper worksheet, I give them a worksheet on Google docs and everybody fills it out. They submit it back to the teacher and then, um, you know, and then they, uh, then they, they complete the task. Right. Um, augmentation uh, with a with a Google Doc would be um, we're going to do it in group work. So I would still um, I'm still like giving them that same worksheet, but instead of kids working on it independently, everybody's collaborating. Um, you know, and we have small groups, and you know everybody's got a laptop, and they all take a section, and they're they're working on that same document. So it's it's a it's a little bit 
better, um, but not, but still kind of the same task. Um, then when we get into the modification piece, that would be where, um, like I have, I have a Google document, but it's allowing students some, uh, some modicum of choice. So, you know, they can, um, they can work on this Google document in this way and provide this kind of evidence, or they could work on it this way. And it's more of a, you know, like they have a different way of showing their learning or working together with a partner. Again, enables some choice. So it's, it's still a similar activity. We're still getting at the same objectives, but we're using technology in a way that is significantly changing the way that we would go about that task. And then the redefinition would be if this is completely impossible without it. So um, maybe for that, for a similar task, they're using that Google document, but they're collaborating with another class that is in Arizona and it's a school in Wisconsin. And they're working on, you know, one part of it, they're asking each other questions, they're collaborating on this document. Um, and it really would not be possible for us to do something like that unless we were using that particular technology. So you'll notice, like, as we go through that progression, all of these things could be done without the use of technology, right? But it has, it has nothing to do with the tool. It has to do with our approach to how we're using the tool. And just because we're following that SAMR model doesn't necessarily, like, it's, it has more to do with active learning and task redefinition than it does necessarily directly with technology um, until you get into that modification redefinition um, area of things, that's really where the technology makes a difference. And the tool that's, that you select is going to have an impact on the way that you that you approach things. And I, I really appreciate, Jason, that you use the same tool throughout um, your examples, because that really shows that it's a lot about perspective. Um, because I might, as a teacher, say, oh, but using a Google Doc instead of a paper worksheet is totally not substitution because I don't have to kill any trees and I can't lose the papers and that kind of stuff. But shifting that perspective to, okay, that that's maybe more of a modification for me, but mm -hmm. for student learning, which is should be our goal when we're using technology, um, that really is just a, a straight up substitution. So without going back to my big question, so without a framework, um, you know, like Rachel, you said, picking something because, hey, this is what the cool kids are doing, or this is what my fellow faculty member is doing, uh, provides some value, but at the end of the day, uh, you don't get to the value for the student, which is the R, you know, finally. And maybe some of these technologies don't ever even get that far. Is that possible? Where, I mean, it reaches its limits and then you maybe have gained the experience to determine that, hey, I need another tool or a different tool, you know, to achieve the objective. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, a, it's, and it's, Yes. Yeah. So long story short, like, you know, it's you, you, the, the outcome is what's important, right? Mm -hmm. It's not how we get there. Um, and uh, the, so, you know, so you, it could be like, it could be a Google doc. It could be maybe a paper worksheet is the best way to accomplish the objective, mm -hmm. right? So you're not just using technology just for the sake of using technology. Um, but really it's about, it's about picking the best tool for the job. Um, and then the other thing too, that like um, is a, is a common mistake that people will make with things like SAMR or PICRAT or Triple E or any of these other frameworks that are out there is they'll, they'll, they'll be like, well, you know, I, like everything should be like, I, I I need to make everything redefinition and, you know, like I need to completely reinvent the way that teaching happens because um, doggone it, like that's the, that's where everybody needs to live. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality of it is like most people are like you, if you find a teacher who's really good at using technology, they're living, they're living at those middle two levels um, like that augmentation modification. They're not there. They'll visit substitution. They'll visit redefinition, but really they're living at the, at the A and the M um, or, you know, with the, with the enhancement, not necessarily the extend or the, or the engage, or, you know, like, it's, it's just kind of like, that's, that's the way, um, that's the way that 
that it is just just in practicality, right? Because um, it takes a lot of effort and creativity and mental. It's a it's a huge cognitive load to get to that redefinition piece. It, it's ex- like you read my mind, Jason, because <laughs> that's what I was gonna. <laughs> gonna say too but I I also when I'm introducing this to teachers or students who haven't heard of it before I um emphasize that because I think otherwise it can get a little scary that oh I've got to be doing all these these things that if I didn't have technology I couldn't do them so and that can be very intimidating for for technology use um, so when you're when you're first getting started, as long as you have those student ob- learning objectives in mind, you know there's nothing wrong with a substitution augmentation approach, um, especially if that helps you get comfortable with the technology so that you can start moving up. Um, and yeah, I trying to redefine everything is never it's just not possible. Mm-hmm. One thing we talked about as we were doing some planning is um, in, in the adoption of any technology framework, there is some, some basics that apply regardless of the framework, uh, that if these things aren't in place, um, technology integration becomes really painful. Um, so we talked about... Um, just the blocking and tackling of technology, networks, device management, obviously uh, making sure that the um, the things around you are not getting in the way of your goals. And uh, that's not always easy, and that's not always necessarily something that the teacher has full control over. So I think a strategy where they're working closely with whoever is responsible for the network and the environment and the bandwidth and, you know, the budgeting process. So that if you need subscriptions and students need accounts, those kinds of things, or if they need devices, those kinds of things have to be dealt with. Um, or I don't care what framework you're using, you're going to, you're going to be challenged. Yeah, and I think um, I think we a lot of those challenges were really highlighted for people like during during the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when we there was a there was a large influx of resources, and now people are purchasing all they have had the opportunity to purchase things that maybe they they hadn't planned on or hadn't what weren't like we're not on the radar just because you know it was it was cost prohibitive or felt mm-hmm. that it was cost prohibitive to be able to do some of these things but then um i think it just just in based off of some of the conversations that i've had with people recently um there was not consideration to um to like they they got the devices but they didn't pay any attention to or less attention to the infrastructure that supports mm-hmm. the devices so it's almost kind of like you're renovating your house and i'm going to have six bathrooms in it um but i don't have like i still have a 20 gallon water heater and my water main coming into the into the house is still only a, a four inch line and i can only handle like i only have enough plumbing capacity uh to be able to support two bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden I've got, you know, six people trying to take a shower at the same time. We got the dishwasher running and we're running clothes and, you know, and people are wondering why the water is just coming out in a trickle. So same kind of, same kind of concept, right. Um, When it comes to, when it comes to making sure that you have the infrastructure in place um, and there's, there needs to be considerable investment in that to make sure that things are reliable and, um, and, and work well for the, the, the capacity that we're asking our devices to have. Yeah, very different model than the traditional computer labs where technology started in a lot of schools. And now you've got a, a one-to-one or a device in many kids' hands at the same time. That's all kinds of, of pain and suffering that can happen if the if the access point can't handle that many connections or you don't have the wherewithal to block, you know, some of the things that may be clogging that network, like excessive backups or downloads or operating system updates or those kinds of things that you're wondering, boy, we should have enough bandwidth, but you know, something's consuming all this. Wow. How do we, how do we deal with this? And that takes some expertise too. Uh, there is, sure. a, that's just not something that, you know, out of the box. Yeah. I'm curious 
you mentioned the pandemic kind of forcing us this direction. Here we are, you know, four years after, and I would think some of these, some of this equipment's wearing out and some of these things have really come to light. What's the pulse in the classroom or in the school district these days as um, you're facing maybe a new round of equipment or whatever? Are kids all one-to-one? Are you, um, you know, doing special things in the classroom that are different with your setup or whatever than what you originally adopted? So um, I can speak to our school district. So here in Oshkosh, um, we've had a one-to-one program for um, starting in starting in sixth grade. We've been one-to-one since about 2018. Um, so we've been we've been at at that for a while. Um, but then you know, a emergency remote learning for us, all of those kinds of things. Then we went then we went one-to-one K-12. Um, but we're actually, we're actually in the process of, and we have a device adoption schedule, like we budget for all of those things, any of that, like ESSER stimulus money that, that came, we didn't spend any of that on technology. We spent that in other ways, um, to, you know, to, to affect other programming in the district. But, um, what we're, we're walking back from, um, that that one to one K twelve, so we're finding that um, a, a lot of our a lot of our instruction uh, is not it does not lend itself well to uh, every kid has a device. So um, and that would not be necessarily in line with a lot of best practices that we're aware of at this point in time too. So um, with some of the focus that we are having on like reading and literacy and student um, like mental health and like all of the other things and just knowing how much exposure kids have outside of school with these kinds of things, um, it's no longer seen as uh, like there's the old school of thought, like, well, let's give them a computer and they'll be engaged and they'll be excited about stuff. Like they, it, that's not the case, um, you know. A, and I think it was a false premise before too, um, for us to for us to put that into into the conversation. But um, we're, like I said, we're in the process of walking back on that, and maybe you know, especially for our youngest learners, um, maybe more along the lines of like a one to two or a one to three even um, ratio that would be a little bit more. Um, it's socially engaging for the students to be working on things together rather than everybody's kind of dialed in and, and sucked in because that's their life outside of school. Interesting. Interesting. And SAMR plays a part as you're making these decisions, I'm sure. Um, you, you want not just substitution, you want to get them past that. So um, getting the right tools in place to allow for that probably has a big um, part in your decision making as well. Yeah. Yes, it does. Awesome. All right. I, I think especially with the with the younger students, when you're thinking about what technology uses are good uses, it's probably those redefinition uses, especially for your younger students. And so many of those things are going to be group projects or um, you know teacher assisted projects where you don't need one to one. And I think that's awesome your school district is willing to look at that data and say, nope, this was not a great choice um, and walk it back. Because I think a lot of um, schools think, oh, we've got these devices, we better use them. And what, you know, what is the goal of our schools to use the (laughs) <laughs> use the tools that are sitting in the classroom or to, to teach our students. And uh, when we look at that goal, we really have to choose what tools are best and understand that we might have made poor choices in the past and we can make better choices going forward. Well, and I would I would just add to that that um, and uh, you 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 hinted at this, I think, in, in what you just said, but like the the teaching needs to drive the tool not the other way around so don't let the technology dictate the way that you teach things what how do you want to accomplish these objectives like what are the objectives and how can the technology enhance and support it and that's really why we use these frameworks so that we can so that we can use that 
that that that it gives us a way to talk about teaching in the context of technology being adapted and and adopted in that use. Yes. Well, we could go on for hours, but we wouldn't have any listeners at the end. So I think we. My dad save... would still be listening. Oh, we... <laughs> <laughs> we'd have one listener at the end. Um, Thank you, need... Dad. <laughs> We need to uh, probably save some stuff for the next time we meet. There's there's a ton more we can obviously talk about here. So thanks for the insightful conversation. Love it. Um, let's move on to another segment of our show that we call Ministry Resources. And that's an area where we kind of highlight some things that hopefully are useful to all y'all. And uh, one of those things is a, uh, you know, the, the continuing education and the master's program that MLC offers. Um, and I'm going to be teaching again this year, uh, enhancing ministry with technology. And uh, I don't know that everything is out yet for you to be able to uh, enroll, but just as a teaser, uh, you know, one thing I'm excited about for my course at least is to the inclusion in a much greater way of artificial intelligence. Uh, that's certainly a way that, uh, ministry can be enhanced with technology, and I'm excited to explore with the students how how that could all happen. Um, so watch for that that's coming up. But there's also an MLC Open Learning webinar coming up. Uh, Sally, you want or Rachel, when do you want to share what's that? What that's all about? Um, sure. And again, I don't think it's out on the website yet, but it should be there very soon. Uh, Rachel gave us the inside knowledge that on November 4th at 7 p.m. Central, there's going to be an AI power hour, mm. boost your productivity with creative tools, uh, led by Dr. James Karlovsky. James is a friend of Wells Tech as well. And this sounds like a really neat session. Uh, the introduction uh, says it'll um, help teachers look at cutting edge AI applications that streamline tasks, enhance creativity, and save valuable time, uh, giving practical strategies to integrate AI tools into your daily workflow, helping you work smarter, not harder. Who doesn't want to do that? That sounds mm -hmm. great. Um, so yeah, definitely plan, mark it on your calendar, November 4th, 7 p.m. Tune in with James. Unlock new levels of efficiency and innovation. Sounds like a, a great webinar. Okay. And open learning has always been free as far as I'm aware. So hopefully this is going to, it looks like this will be a free event as well. Awesome. Um, Martin, you mentioned AI, James is doing AI. Um, maybe a good time to plug our Wells Tech AI Summit, because I think we're still uh, looking for nominations for we that are. as yeah, well. I put that in community news and feedback, but let's elevate it to our ministry <laughs> resources it. section. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. We are holding a Wells Tech AI Summit February 21 to 23. It's invitation only, but we are taking nominations for people who can contribute to the conversation where we talk about the place and practice of AI in our synod. Um, you can email me directly and we'll put a link in the show notes uh, where you can learn a little bit more about the summit uh, proposed agenda, although I think that's probably going to change maybe even significantly as we figure out who's going to be there. It's going to be 20 to 25 people. Uh, everybody on this podcast will be there, hopefully, uh, and some some other smart people to talk about uh, AI and actually ask the right questions and uh, see where we go from there. So it's a, it's a great synodical conversation we're going to have around AI and its place in ministry. So take a look at that. And if you're interested, nominate somebody or yourself. Had a lot of nominations so far. Probably got 30 or so people. So we're looking for more to pick from. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing that up, Sally. I think we can move on to our picks of the week. Rachel, what do you bring to the table today? Well, since we were talking about, uh, tech tools and integration models. Um, it made me think of one of my favorite resources for finding tech tools um, and something that I use in the graduate class I'm currently teaching, which is enhancing the curriculum with technology. Um, this is the teacher's guide to tech from Cult of Pedagogy. Um, it's not free. 
So I will just start with that. It is not free. You do have to pay for it. It's $25, um, but it is one of the best $25 I've ever spent. Um, and I have spent it a couple of times because the authors come out with a new version every single year. So this is the 2024 version. Um, and I usually buy every other year, every three years. Um, but I, even though I bought in 24, I'm planning on doing 25 too with all the AI changes. Um, it's a super long PDF that just has tons and tons of tech tools that have been vetted by teachers um, and have ideas for how to use them. It's got links, it's got um, explanations of the tools, um, just so, so many different categories. And um, it is really, really worth, I think, the money for having a condensed list of vetted tech tools that um, you could use in your classroom. It's got over 750 tools, uh, 50 different categories. Um, it's very, very thorough and, uh, and well done. So um, it is $25, you can buy it online. And um, yeah, that's the teacher's guide to tech. Nice for sharing. Yeah, that's a lot of work to kind of go through that and provide meaningful feedback from a teacher's perspective, especially. But Jason, what are you bringing today? All right. So uh, we're going old school is new school. So a Padlet <laughs> has been around for in, in ed tech terms, like this is a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. um, I, this was one of the first Web 2.0 tools that I ever used with students um, because it's been, a, it's been a great collaboration tool, lots of really neat things going on. Um, they were stagnant for quite a few years, um, but just recently, it must have been acquired or something, uh, there has been a huge influx of new innovation that, uh, that Padlet has rolled out. So um, they've got some really interesting uh, generative of AI tools that are in there. So uh, like their image generator is, is super cool, uh, really fast and does a, does a really nice job with that. Um, and then just in general, like thinking about concepts graphically and organizing, um, organizing concepts in like more of a, a digital whiteboard kind of a format. Uh, it's a really great tool for those kinds of things. Uh, still has like a freemium model. So for no cost, you can do up to, I think it's, it's either three or five boards uh, that you can put together, but uh, you can continually reuse those. So like if you have something uh, that you put together and you want to um, just use it for an activity and then delete everything that's on there and then start over fresh again, uh, you can definitely do that. So um, a, one of those very, uh, very simple to pick up tools, it's very simple to utilize, uh, it takes very little training to get in there um, and then uh, can help you move through that SAMR framework work uh, so that you are um, looking at things in a different way uh, with a very intuitive tool. So Padlet is worth checking out again if you have not seen it for a while. Uh, I was in pretty, I was really impressed with the changes that I saw there. So Jason, just looking at it, I had, I'm not aware of, not been aware of Padlet. Is it for independent learning or is it for a teacher to uh, augment their lesson with it? Is it something that you put in the hands of students to create content what, uh, or all of the above? So I was going to say the answer to your question is yes, Martin. Okay. Um, so the, the best way that I can describe Padlet is uh, to think of it as like an online whiteboard and sticky notes. So you can put, um, and, the, and the sticky notes are multimedia. So it can be a text, it can be an image, it can be a video, audio recording. There are comments that you can put back and forth if you would like to do that as well. Um, you can you know, have more structure to it. So like you see on here, it's a KWL kind of a chart. So you could do something like that or it can be more free form. Um, so it really just kind of depends. Uh, and again, it's very intuitive. So um, depending on what activity you want to do, you can adapt it to those different purposes. Sweet. Very nice. nice. Your cost to it? Hmm. 
Um, so it is, it is free for um, like you get, it's either three or five boards you can use for free. Uh, and then past that, there is a cost to it. I want to say it's like a hundred dollars a year gets you unlimited access. Um, but I, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Oh, thanks. Sally, there hold it go. up. <laughs> Classroom 199 a year for two teachers. School is a thousand a year. 200 free student accounts. Sweet. Mm -hmm. All right. Sally, I think you're up. My turn. And mine is an AI pick. Um, I've been doing a lot of exploration with generating AI imagery and um, happened upon something in my reading and stuff that looks to be pretty impressive. Um, this is a site called midjourney.com. And Midjourney is um, known for their high quality AI imagery. It is a fee based site. It costs, I believe, $10 a month to have a subscription here. But what I'm showing is kind of a compilation of different images. And I will say, you know, there are some restrictions. Obviously, they can't do violent and, you know, graphic things in, in Mid Journey. They, they restrict that. But then there's a lot of sci-fi oriented and things like that that you'll see in here. But what I really like about it is that you can learn from what other people are doing. So they put together this mixture of images and you can actually click in and see their descriptions, their prompt, and you can actually copy their prompt and reuse it and change it, which is pretty amazing. I'm just going to give it a try here. Um, I do have a subscription personally. So this one is calling on a certain artist. It mentions William Morris as the style. Um, but I'm going to put in fluffy llamas just for fun uh -huh. and see what happens. And when you generate an image um, with Midjourney, it takes a little while to create. And you kind of walk through. Oh, and while we're waiting, you can see that there are a lot of llama images in my in my history. Um, <laughs> anyway, llama origami, it looks like. Yeah, That's llama cool. origami. And I, again, I copied from other people just trying out different things. But then the images kind of produce for you, and you can look at each one and figure out which one you might like best if you're interested in any of them. Um, maybe I like this one best. Then I have the ability to. Um, vary it subtly or strongly um, to do creative upscaling. And so you get a whole nother selection of images once you pick on one of these I items here. And I'll just go back and wait. You can see it kind of generates through. It takes a minute. But um, I have tried a lot of different AI image generators, and this one is really impressive to me. And you could tell from from the um, different things you could explore and the variety that was there. And so I think I picked um, maybe the second one or third one. And then I got this variety that came from telling it to vary it. So um, you can also do things like, let's say I don't like this leaf right here and I want it to be a tail. I can select parts of an image and tell it to replace it with something. So I've seen them replace a, a, a flower against a skyline with a hot air balloon or something like that. So um, if you're, you know, finding things that aren't exactly to your liking, like this little leaf standing up like a crown or whatever, you can tell it to replace things. So um, there's a lot more to it. Interestingly, you can interact with it on Discord, which um, is a whole nother realm of, bring in people that are comfortable with discord because that's a whole uh, kind of society in and itself that's doing discord things and stuff. But um, there's a lot of things that you can do to refine your imagery and you can just get all kinds of styles out of it. So I've been really enjoying just playing with it and coming up with different uh, llamas. So why not? <laughs> and if you want to explore more, this seems like a great tool to do it, just to learn more about AI and imagery. I yeah. think I'm done with Mid Journey for now. So your turn, Martin. It'd be interesting to see what they do with biblical characters and settings. Oh, um, that's a good know, idea. Trying to theme a Bible study, etc. So I, I really like this gal. Don't you think mm -hmm. she looks cool? Anyway, you better scary. get me off this page, Martin. Where should we go next? <laughs> 
Let's go to Miro. That's my okay. pick of the week. Um, I don't know if I've, I think we've talked about Miro. We had a whole show on whiteboarding. Jason brought up whiteboarding with Padlet, and Miro is kind of a business version of of that. Miro's been around a while. They kind of specialize in whiteboard collaboration. They kind of got their you know uh, popularity during COVID, and they've kind of taken it to the next level with AI and all the things that they do. I use it uh, extensively in my in my enhancing ministry with technology course, where I'm having all the students in there. It's uh, real easy to do almost any kind of collaboration. You can uh, create post-it notes, post polls, embed documents. You can do whole presentations. Uh, so a lot of my uh, uh, presentations within that course, for instance, are basically recorded sessions in um, in Miro, and then they have access to the student, has access to them, uh, can augment them, can... Um, replicate them and build their own. You can embed videos, links, PDFs, wakelets we've talked about. There's diagramming, commenting, tagging. Um, and it is an infinite canvas, which is kind of nice. So you basically start out with a blank slate and you can uh, build links to different sections of your infinite canvas. So it's it's really a great brainstorming tool, but also can add some structure to um, what you're doing as well. So for instance, we talked about this AI summit. Uh, that's the first place I went to begin to collect all the information. All the nominees are there as separate entries and you can embed emails and all the things that go on to to do a conference, for instance, um, or a class or a topic or research, whatever. Um, Miro is free for educators, uh, which is kind of nice. I know MLC has a license, so anybody that's on faculty there can can sign up and get a copy. And they've got good educator pricing otherwise as well. So um, just a, a super tool if you're looking for, for that kind of thing. Uh, Web-based, but they also have apps, and you can uh, bring it up on a phone or tablet, those kinds of things, and works equally, or equally well. It's kind of crazy when you've got multiple people in there, and you can kind of see their little <laughs> cursor floating around with their name on it, what they're doing, what they're looking at, what they're clicking on. Um, but a super powerful tool that uh, really is sturdy and, and holds up well to, to really whatever you want to use it for. So really like it. That's Miro, M-I-R-O dot com. If you're looking for a tool, a good whiteboarding tool like that. Awesome. Um, I think I figured out what's the difference between you and me, Martin, and it's that you like wide open things that allow all kinds of stuff in it. That reminds me of OneNote and how you can you pull like, in all kinds of different things into you OneNote. Like structure. I like structure. So I'm looking for these templates that they provide, which is super they cool. Do. They do have where a lot of you templates can structure too. things and stuff. Yeah. So, so. something for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's good we've got you working with data, Sally. That's <laughs> I like She's that. She's doing what she loves. That's right. <laughs> Let's move on to community news and feedback. Yeah, we recently had an email from my friend Michael Vlieger. We go to church together at St. Paul's in North Mankato, and he teaches at Risen Savior in Mankato. And he was sharing some interesting AI resources that he came across. Um, first up was something called My Lens, and it'll take in a lot of different things and topics on a subject and consolidate it into um, teaching visuals. And he sent us like some mind maps and different examples that he had done with my lens. Um, the, the URL is my lens, L E N S dot A I. And it's tagline is simplify anything visually. So it explains anything in visuals. I thought that was a pretty cool find. Um, the other one though, it's kind of uh, blown me away, and it is actually a Google product. It's called NotebookLM.Google.com, and um, NotebookLM is an AI-powered research and writing assistant that works best with the sources you upload. So same mm -hmm. concept. You feed it some different sources, and it can produce um, 
it can kind of consolidate down all the material that it's it's read into things like facts, FAQs, or, or a briefing, a summary kind of document. And that's all well and good. Very cool. It says experimental on it. It's kind of new from Google or whatever with AI. Um, but what's most impressive about it is that they've just recently announced, I think the date was September 11th, that they you can now listen to a conversation about the sources that you add to it. Um, and I will put uh, links in the show notes to different overview videos that Michael shared that kind of explain all these capabilities and stuff. But he also sent us, he said he was studying, um, let's see, he got a collection of things for his seventh and eighth grade life science class, uh, currently studying microbiomes. And uh, he fed it to the things and he got a conversation, a.k.a. a podcast generated between two AI speakers. Um, Martin, if you have that example queued up, we'd love to hear a little piece of that. Let me see if I can cue this up. Human microbiome that invisible universe of bacteria and other microorganisms living on and in you right now. And, you know, what's fascinating is that for years we treated bacteria like public enemy number one, something to be scrubbed and sanitized away. Right. Turns out they're holding the VIP passes to our health, impacting everything from how well we digest to how strong our immune systems are. Okay, so let's unpack this a bit. We hear... So those were not real people is what you're telling me? <laughs> That's what I'm telling you, Martin. I, I'm a little bit nervous for my job based on that. They look, they sounded pretty enjoyable to listen to. That was all AI generated um, in podcast format. And if you keep listening, they like make jokes with each other and stuff like mm -hmm. that. It's pretty cool. Scary. Um, <laughs> yeah. Scary. Pretty amazing. That LM, I, I talked about that on the podcast, uh, maybe six 12 months ago even and it's really cool and this is a whole new thing that they're doing with us but uh the the nice thing about it is you're basically building your own large your know, small language model so you feed content and it doesn't pay attention to anything else on the web and so you can throw in all kinds of documents or research papers or sermons or you know whatever and then you can you know talk to the AI about that content. Uh, so it gets very specific. So it's a, it's a cool technology that kind of gives you a little bit more control over the AI experience. So pretty cool. And then the AI can talk to you about yeah, that apparently. content. So <laughs> that's the new thing. So mm -hmm. that is super cool. Thanks, Michael, Thanks, for Michael. sharing. Yeah. I uh, appreciate that you're always learning new things and sharing it with with our Wells Tech friends. Um, a couple more things I've mentioned. One is that the Wells Women's Ministry um, group is having an online class. Um, it's called Heirs Together of God's Grace. It's, it's based on that book. Um, it looks like it is um, a fee-based class. Um, and it's a study of what the Bible says about men and women and God's design for them. Um, they will be offering it as an 11 week online course, Saturday mornings from 8 to 9.30 a.m. and Monday evenings, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Um, it looks like maybe it's already underway, but it might not be too late to get to join in and maybe watch some of the back things that you perhaps have mm -hmm. missed. Hopefully that's the one that I was supposed to highlight. I'm not sure if they have another webinar coming up or not, but we'll look for that for our next show. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, lastly, I came across this article and just wanted to make mention on our education focused um, podcast that there is a cybersecurity pilot program being sponsored by the FCC. Um, I want to say they have about $200 million available and there are applications out there that uh, the deadline is in early November. Mm -hmm. So um, they're looking for all different types of schools to participate in this. And they just want to look at a lot of different angles around cybersecurity for schools, um, schools and libraries. So if you are interested, now would be the time to get out there and check out what it takes to apply for this basically grant money to do some cybersecurity stuff um, for your school. So check that out. We'll have a link in the show notes. 
and that's can what I, I add just a, can I add just a small detail to that one Sally yes um, so this is an extension of the e-rate program uh, mm -hmm. so if schools are already applying for e-rate funds then they would be eligible to participate in this program if they are not yet applying for uh, for e-rate funds they have to go through that verification and setup process first uh, before they'd be able to apply for right. this yeah, I looked into this a little bit. Our Lutheran Schools office asked my opinion on this. And now while $200 million sounds like a lot spread across you know, the country and they're giving priority to to low income and I think rural settings. So, um, you know, it may be worth, you know, putting in and there are options for help, you know, to, to apply. And then the funding goes toward, you know, things like firewalls and antivirus systems and those kinds of things. So. Don't let me forget. In a future future episode, I have a pick that will help people uh, figure that figure that cybersecurity stuff out. So mm -hmm. I'll add that cool. to a future show. A little tease, thanks, Jason. <laughs> you're get you're getting you're catching on to this uh, podcast thing. It's all marketing. <laughs> I think you felt threatened by those AI podcasters. So you're bringing you brought your A game today. Awesome. Uh, Rachel and Jason, thank you so much for your time today and your, your expertise and your continued uh, concern and care for our listeners. I think uh, we're bringing some good stuff and hopefully they feel the same. We're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. Allie and I'll be back and um, we don't know what the topic is. Well, we may, we have some ideas, but uh, <laughs> we're not ready to share those at this point. But uh, we hope you will return for episode uh, seven thirty five, and yeah. uh, you know we'll keep we'll keep the trains running on time here. So, thanks everybody for your time and attention, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>